You should remember from your last test review podcast and first unit tests that sometimes the AP exam will include multiple questions on an image or pair of images. We only have three images, no image pairs for this test. The test will also include 30 general multiple choice questions, some of which will involve images as well. All of your matching questions will appear, even the squirrely materials and techniques questions. You know I'm not crazy about these, but you also know that the College Board is putting more emphasis on this knowledge. And finally, you'll have one essay question. Let's start there. This is actually an essay question from 1992. Uh, I used with a different but very similar Egyptian statue. I've modified it to reflect the current AP approach and included dates on the slide. You'll not need to give that information. So here's the big news this time. You're getting the question in advance again, but this time you're going to have to write without notes. Think of this as learning how to swim. This time around I'm deflating the water wings a little, and eventually you're going to have to jump off the diving board and answer a question that you have not seen in advance. The first two parts of this question are very straightforward, but you will have to have this information memorized. You can answer both parts in a single sentence, and you can refer to the works as the work on top and the work on bottom, although of course you need to know their titles for the identification. Part C asks about the function of these statues, how they were actually used, and how this use reflects each culture's beliefs. Remember that this is an invitation to write as much as you can about the culture, as well as about the work of art, so be specific as possible. Details are always good. Using specific evidence is even more important when you answer Part D, because you're going to want to make references to the work's actual appearance. Now, the works will be there on the essay question. Don't be afraid, by the way, to note similarities as well as differences. These are, after all, both works produced by ancient Near Eastern cultures, and there are some important similarities, especially in style. As always, try to employ your art history vocabulary. This work shows up not only in your image-based questions, but in your regular multiple choice questions as well. It is a longtime College Board favorite and a genuinely important work. By the way, if you see several somewhat repetitive questions about the same work of art, this usually means it has appeared on multiple AP tests in the past or has shown up in several of my sources on the new course. In other words, this is one you ought to know. So what do you need to know here? Well, who are these people? How was this work made? And make sure you know the difference between bas-relief and sunken relief. What function did this work of art serve? What event did it commemorate? What stylistic conventions do you observe, especially conventions designed to highlight the relative importance of the participants? I'm going to give you one very broad hint, since I think one of the actual AP questions I'm using is a little unclear. There is no historical record of the specific event shown on the steel, that is, this ruler's investiture by a god, but the ruler himself is a very real historical figure, and we have lots of evidence of his rule. By the way, one of the wrong answers about this work will be metal repoussé. You haven't encountered that before. It's a sculptural technique where thin sheets of metal are punched out into a shape. This gold face of Agamemnon is an especially famous example of repoussé. I'm just telling you this so that you don't worry when you see an unfamiliar term on the test. Remember that by May you will know a lot more art vocabulary. Ah, the first work you encountered in this course if you did the summer reading and viewing. So, how does the artist show rank? What animals are used to symbolize the pharaoh? I'll give you a hint. In both cases, these animals are shown making life difficult for the enemy. And note that I said animals, plural. What do the small stacked bodies represent? What is this work commemorating? Who's the funny guy with the hat? Left side, and what's he doing? Finally, what is the term for the way the narrative is arranged? Think Calvin and Hobbes. By the way, the questions refer to left and right side. That's as you look at them. So the serpipards, that's those funny animals with the entwined necks, are on the right. And this is going to be true throughout the course. Let me also note that one of your general multiple choice questions asks why this work is so important in art history. And for that matter, in regular history. And you should know that. So what do we always want to know about a work? What is it? In other words, identify this work. How was it made? Where was it found? And what function did it and similar works, hint, hint, serve? 
How does this work reflect its culture and that culture's values and practices? And what's happening here? By the way, I added some questions about who or what shows up in the circles. You've seen those before. Oh, another question about this work. How would you describe the character of the laws written in the cuneiform on this stele? I've included a pretty broad hint in the title of the slide. What are the characteristics of relief sculpture in the ancient Near East? What devices are used to show narrative, to indicate an individual's importance or sometimes impotence? What are the names for the three kinds of stone relief sculpture that you've encountered so far? Only the work on the right is one of your required images, but I think it's quite possible that you would be asked to identify uh, the period for the two works to its left. And again, you need to know the period more specifically than just New Kingdom. We talked about this when we talked about how New Kingdom architecture was different from Old Kingdom architecture. What would you not find in the building on the right that was originally placed in the building on the left? Well, this is another image in question that has shown up frequently in past exams. I guess the College Board thinks these are cool, too. Know what these beasts are called and the function that they served at the palace. So here we have a materials question. Not an easy one, although I actually think you won't have any trouble guessing the right answer if, hint, you know a little geography. Remember that the Mesopotamians were heavily dependent on trade. They produced a lot of valuable agricultural goods for sale, but they needed to import many items, including stone and what is the white stuff on this work? Where does it come from? So I thought that the question, or, or rather the answer choice, for this work was a little tricky. Scribes were members of the upper classes. They were not pharaohs, however, and that's probably the most important reason why the scribe's body is shown as less than perfect. That's not one of the choices you're given, however, and I'd note that his clothes do not show especially high status, but actually clothes were not as good a guide to status in Egypt as in some societies because archaeologists seem to, archaeological uh, explorations seem to show that they didn't wear very much. This is, there's another question about this work. What is its function? You know it has something to do with the afterlife because art in Egypt always does. But, and I don't think I mentioned this in my lecture, this was found in the general vicinity of a pharaoh's tomb. Actually, scholars aren't entirely sure of where it was originally placed since the site was heavily looted, but I think it's pretty clear that the scribe is ready to go to work for a reborn pharaoh. But it is possible that this was a Ka statue for the scribe himself. Possible, but not as likely, since this was an old kingdom work, and that's a period when elaborate tombs tended to be reserved for pharaohs. So I thought this was another somewhat tricky question. One obvious advantage of sunken relief on columns, as this photo uh, from the temple at Karnak shows, is that it casts strong shadows in the Egyptian sun, and we talked about that. Of course, the sculptures would have been painted back in the day, but the shadows still would have highlighted the message. Sunken reliefs also preserve the structure of the columns. They still look round, and therefore they still create the impression of a papyrus forest, which was quite deliberate. Now, the expert who wrote this question says that sunken relief is not easier to carve, so I just gave you the answer. Uh, the correct reason for sunken relief that surprised me, since it seemed in some ways to contradict the point about retaining the column structure, is that sunken reliefs hide the function of columns as supporting elements and emphasize instead the images and messages that they carry. So sunken relief maintains the uniformity of the column shape while focusing attention on the message and not on the columns. Well, I thought that was confusing, but probably right. The person entering the temple was bombarded with important symbols and messages, but also confronted with an image of the primeval forest. Sunken relief accomplished both, while raised relief sculptures would only preserve the message. Anyway, I just gave you the answer. As always, I included this question, even though I found it somewhat confusing, because I want you to get used to, well, confusing questions that somebody else wrote. There are a number of similarities between these two works. I don't think you'll have any trouble figuring out the right answer. But note that you will not have the image for this question, so you'll have to remember what these images look like from their titles. Okay, you guys all know this one, right? 
Subtractive sculptures involve carving away the material, usually stone or wood. Additive structures are built up, usually of clay or metal. What's tricky here is remembering which figurines are carved, that is subtractive, out of stone, and which are made of clay or metal, which makes them additive. And this is particularly hard to see when they're painted, so unfortunately you just have to know. So here I'm looking for a term, not the specific place, although of course you should recognize the place as well. Looking at this floor plan, where is the main entrance, really the only entrance? What do those dots represent? Does the plan show you anything about the height of the walls or of the ceilings? I'm going to answer that one, by the way. No, it doesn't. For that, you need a different kind of plan called an elevation. We're going to see lots of elevations, especially when we get to medieval churches. So what are the characteristic stylistic features of this culture's art as exhibited by these works? By the way, you haven't seen the image on the right, but it's from the same culture, which you need to be able to identify, and you should see the similarities. These images themselves will not be on the test. Instead, you'll have a description of the stylistic inventions. Again, I don't think you'll find it hard. I've had you focus on Old Kingdom and New Kingdom, but this is an actual old AP question. What's tricky is that one choice is 2000 BCE and another is 2500 BCE. Which is closer? You're going to need to look this one up on your works list. Oops, I didn't include this in my lecture slides. It's all text without images, but wouldn't you know it turned up as an AP question. And I forgot to add it into the lecture this year. Well, now I'm adding it. This is the Rosetta Stone, which had the same inscription in three languages, one of which was Egyptian hieroglyphics, and one of which was a form of ancient Greek that scholars knew how to interpret, and therefore they were able to use that to decipher hieroglyphics. So, what two required works that you've studied are carved with gray whack, a hard, dark sandstone? I'm showing you a picture of the rock and of another sculpture that's made from gray whack. Hint, one of the works is from ancient Egypt, one is from our global prehistoric unit. By the way, there are three works that you've studied in the first two units that are carved from gray whack. The answer will have just two of them. So this is one of the most famous moments in the history of archaeology. In 1923, Howard Carter opened this previously unopened, undiscovered tomb and found an incredible gold coffin. Whose coffin was it? If anyone gets this wrong, I would be very surprised. So this is an example of where I'm looking uh, not for identification, but for a vocabulary word used to describe this kind of stone commemorative slab. And by the way, we'll see a lot more of these when we get to Mayan architecture. Oh, this is another one of those terms that you need to know, but I think it's an easy one to remember. Oops. You all recognize the pylon, right? This is actually from the Temple of Luxor. Note that the walls slope. I'm not sure I made that point in my lecture. They slope because they're imitating the mountains. Remember, uh, the sun rises and sets between the mountains? At any rate, I just gave you the answer. Here's another term you need to know. The photo will not appear on the exam, but it should give you the answer. And that's, I come now to the end of the test review podcast. Good luck. You all did great on that first unit test. I expect great results on this one as well.